Well, hello once again. Welcome back to HS211, History of the Restoration Movement Online. In this final lecture of our seventh week here, we're going to be looking at the idea of parachurch organizations, and specifically one of the first advocates within the Restoration Movement of the foundation of parachurch organizations, a man by the name of David S. Burnett. And we should probably begin by just describing what a parachurch organization is, and that is simply, it comes from the Greek word para, meaning to be above the church. And what that means is the establishment of an organization that is connected to a church, but is not affiliated with any one particular congregation, and sometimes even any particular denomination. Uh, for example, today we would know that there are many parachurch organizations like Gideon's International. That is a group that is made for producing Bibles and distributing Bibles all throughout the world. They are not tied to any one particular denomination, so they are above a church denomination, but they are made up of Christians who are committed to distributing Bibles. And so what we're going to see here is we're going to see within the Restoration Movement a call for greater organization, and that organization will frequently mean the development of a parachurch organization. So, with all that under our belts there, let's get going and let's see what we can find about this interesting and often controversial situation. So, we really need to begin this discussion of parachurch organizations with the problem of growth. If you remember from your textbook readings, in the mid-1830s, the Stone Movement and the Campbell Movement will experience a merger that they will have a famous meeting on the week of Christmas in 1832, and Barton Stone and Raccoon John Smith will have their famous handshake solidifying their union, and then they will send people out to announce that the Stone Churches and the Campbell Churches have merged into one group. And the, this merger is going to take two fairly active movements and put them all together, and in addition that they will continue their work of evangelism on the frontier. And before we know it, by the 1840s, we're going to have a church that has roughly 30,000 members, which is pretty large for, you know, being in the middle of nowhere on the frontier. And it should also be noted that these churches are often very small congregations, usually consisting of less than 200 people. And so what we're dealing with here is potentially as many as 1,500 different churches. And the question becomes, how do we get all of these different churches, which are located and scattered all throughout the 15 states of the United States at this time, how do we get them to cooperate? How do we get them to organize in such a way that somebody who is in a Christian church, say in Ohio, knows that they are connected with a Christian church in Georgia? How do we, in many ways, encourage this kind of cross cultural communication among Christians of the movement. Well, the problem with that is these churches are all practicing what's called congregational autonomy, that each individual group or each individual church is run by its own board of elders and they are not answerable to anybody else. And this makes the problem of inter-church uh, cooperation very difficult because if one group of elders doesn't want to have anything to do with another church's elders, whether they be across the street or whether they be 500 miles away in a different state, the very bottom line is it won't happen. And so by 1841, many of the leaders within the Restoration Movement, particularly Alexander Campbell, are going to start writing in their journals and in their newspapers, we need to do something to get more organized. And we need to specifically uh, do something to make sure that we are acting as a cohesive unit in the name of Christ. And this will, you know, have many challenges that will spring up because of this call. 
Now, the call that Alexander Campbell will issue in his Millennial Harbinger is he's basically going to say, churches at the individual level can accomplish some pretty impressive and important things for local evangelism, local ministry. But if we really want to do something like winning this entire world for Christ, we're going to have to act as a unit and pull our resources together. And so Campbell will write a almost two year in length article. He'll be publishing this every month in his Millennial Harbinger, describing why the church needs to act corporately. And he'll eventually conclude this set of articles with five conclusions of things that it would be difficult, if not impossible, for separate churches to accomplish by themselves. But together, there would be the chance that they could do this. And the first thing that he points out is that if the churches work together, we could be producing more Bibles and we could be distributing those Bibles on a national or international scale. Now, we probably need to start here because, well, let's be honest, most of us come from a Christian context where we can go just down the street and we can purchase Bibles. It doesn't take a lot in this country to get a hold of a Bible. But in this time of uh, the 1840s, it is just notable that while Bibles are certainly common, they are not easy to get a hold of. And frequently, Bibles also have, you know, the kinds of notes that we like to see in our Bibles today. You know, oh, if you have an NIV study Bible or an NET Bible with over 10,000 footnotes, you'll know real quick that there's often a big difference between what the Bible says and what many commentators say the Bible says. And so, in the Restoration Movement, there will be a big call for the producing of Bibles that have no commentary, that it's just the text of Scripture. And of course, this raises the question, how do you print such Bibles? And so, basically, that process involves you have to buy a printing press, or preferably many printing presses. You have to buy plates, basically a pre-formulated set of letters and characters that will print each page correctly. And, you know, we're talking about you know, anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 plates, depending on how big a print you want your Bible to be. And that's just for one language. What happens if you want to print the Bible, say, in Spanish, or in German, or in French? Well, in that case, then you're going to be needing plates for those as well. And you could see how this process of Bible printing and Bible production could become very, very costly. And Campbell basically says, an individual church can't afford this by themselves. But collectively, the churches of this movement could do something like that. Next, Campbell says that churches would have difficulty sending out missionaries. And if we look at it from this perspective, you know, a missionary could be doing things like Paul shows in the book of Acts, they could be getting to their mission field, and they could be doing a tent-making ministry, they could be working for a living, and they could be trying to support themselves on the mission field. And while that is certainly one way to do it, it is not a very effective way, because as Paul himself even, ha even discovered, he had to spend more time working than he could spend time preaching. And so, it makes a lot more sense if you are going to send a missionary out that you support them financially. And this is what we see Paul doing when a gift comes in from the Philippian church, for example. Paul is able to stop his tent-making ministry for a while and to just pour himself full-time into preaching the gospel. And so Campbell is going to note, if we're wanting to send out missionaries, and we're specifically wanting them to do the majority of their work actually preaching the gospel instead of having to work to support themselves, the churches will need to band together. Because as he notes, an individual church probably can't afford all of the things that goes into making a missionary. For example, they'll have to support the cost of passports, visas, 
the travel cost of actually getting someone on a ship to get them there. And not to mention, if they're going to a place where they don't already know the language, they'll need either professional language support, or they'll need someone who is sufficiently educated if they're going to a place where no one knows the language, that this person would be able to pick up the language, learn it, and then translate the Bible for them. Again, this is quite a monumental task for just one church group. But it is certainly possible if a lot of churches are pooling their money to be able to afford to do this for not just one missionary, but for many missionaries. And so, once again, Campbell is going to urge the churches need to band together if they're going to send out competent missionaries that will actually have the time and the resources to preach the gospel full time. Now, a third problem that Campbell is going to note is that for an elder to be competent in the church, for a preacher or an elder to actually do the job that they are called for, this will be a person who will need to be fairly well educated. Now, as we pointed out earlier in our class, there are certainly times where people on the frontier are going to say, you know, I don't need an education to preach. I just need a Bible and I need to know how to read and I need to have just the gumption to get up there and preach the word. Now, one of the things that's going to kind of rein that idea of the frontier in is going to be Alexander Campbell himself. People are going to see, here's this guy from Glasgow, or from, uh, I should say, from uh, Ireland who studied at Glasgow. And here he is, he knows how to speak Greek, he knows how to read Hebrew, he knows how to speak and read Latin. And here's a person who can, at the drop of a hat, say, no, you're wrong about this because in the original language it says this. Boom. And so what we're going to find is that because of Alexander Campbell's success as a highly educated clergyman, there is going to be a demand that well-trained and competent ministers within the Restoration Movement will be able to do things such as read from the original Greek New Testament and be able to say, well, here's what words mean. Here's how you translate this properly. And so what we're going to find is to get someone to that level of training is going to require more than just having a Sunday school of country farmers. It will require the beginning of an educational system. And this will become Alexander Campbell's primary pet project. In the 1840s, he will advocate for the founding of a college, which he will start uh, called Bethany College in what is today Bethany, West Virginia. And so Campbell will focus almost all of his efforts there for the last 20, 25 years of his life on getting this educational institution to a point where it is training competent ministers, competent elders to do the work of the church. Now, interestingly, Campbell doesn't see this as a theological school. He will advocate a very strong liberal arts mentality. And basically he says, if you teach a person to read or write, if you teach a person how to acquire languages, if you teach a person just simply to read the Bible in its original languages, the rest will take care of itself. Now, this idea won't necessarily carry through until the modern day, but it is an idea that Campbell will certainly believe with all his heart, and many of the people who follow in, the, in its wake are going to basically become very Renaissance-type people, that they will be very well acquainted with classics of Greek and Latin, and that they will be able to make those kind of connections between antiquity and the ideas of the Bible. Now, a fourth thing that Campbell is going to say for why churches need to be organized is the problem of heresy. And we've been looking at this time and time again. How do you really rein in a person who is preaching something false or even destructive to the church if you have congregational polity? Theoretically, if the elders of your church like what you're preaching, there's no way to stop it, even if it's going to send people to hell if they believe it. And what we're going to find is that by the 1830s and 1840s, we're going to start to see many people within the Restoration Movement starting to advocate bad ideas, at least bad ideas worthy of being stopped. For example, Richard McNamara of the Stone Group will join the Shakers, a 
fairly controversial group that believed that men and women needed to be separated. Absolutely no marriage, absolutely no sexuality, no children whatsoever. And so this group will have its heyday in the mid 1800s. And people are going to look at McNamara leaving for the Shakers and they're going to say, see, this whole restoration movement idea can only lead to people adopting really weird ideas. Another example will be Sidney Rigdon, who is a friend of Alexander Campbell. And Rigdon, when he meets a man by the name of Joseph Smith, will in many ways ally with him, and eventually they will help to start the Mormon organization. Now this is one of those things that we could probably talk about for the next two hours and still kind of come up with interesting ideas. But the bottom line is going to be that Sidney Rigdon will play a major role in the founding of the Mormon group. And once again, the question is, how do you stop someone like that, especially when they are appealing to scriptures not from the Bible, but from a newly minted book called the Book of Mormon? And then lastly, what we're going to see is people like Jesse Ferguson, who is a very popular preacher at the Nashville Church. He is going to start espousing the ideas of universalism and spiritualism, or specifically contacting through seances the dead. And so what's going to happen there is Alexander Campbell is going to put his foot down and say that the church in Nashville needs to put a stop to Jesse Ferguson's preaching. And so there's going to be a massive split of the Nashville church, which is the second largest church in the movement at that time, over whether or not to follow Jesse Ferguson or not. And so this whole question of how do you stop bad doctrine is going to become a pressing issue for the movement as it keeps growing and as more and more people begin preaching. And C Campbell's simple answer is that the churches need to collectively agree if one denomination has excommunicated their, a person, that the rest of the groups or the rest of the churches need to follow suit. But again, this is a very hard thing to accomplish if you are practicing congregational autonomy. And then the last thing that Campbell is going to suggest is that there's just going to be a need to have large amounts of money on hand to do church-oriented work. Sometimes you're going to want to build a very large church building. Sometimes you're going to want to do a benevolent ministry that's going to require raising thousands, if not tens of thousands, maybe even close to millions of dollars. How do you do this? How do you raise that kind of money when most of your churches are rural churches supported by people on a farm or subsistence level income? Well, Campbell's simple answer is there needs to be a place for the churches to say, let us do this together. Let us pull our money. Let us pull our resources and collectively we will build this project. And so this is going to be kind of Campbell's catch all for this problem. What do we do to organize this movement in such a way that if we needed to build something big, and we're not even sure what that something is right yet, but is there a place, is there a way to pull those kind of resources above and beyond just churches saying, hey, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? And so all five of these things are going to become Campbell's call that the church needs to organize. And this is going to create a very basic problem. But Campbell, didn't you say way back when, when we were breaking off from the Baptist groups, didn't you say that we shouldn't have church denominations? And so the biggest question is going to be, how do you create organization without creating a denomination? And to be honest, there's going to be no easy answer for this. Because to create an organization that is a parachurch, that is above the individual congregation, is going to, in many instances, create what looks like a denominational structure. And so the people who are going to be interested in organization will frequently be also denigrated as trying to start a denomination. And we'll see this in many cases. But because the movement is growing so big, we could probably point out about five or six different people, but we, we're only going to focus on one, and that is a person by the name of David Stats Barnett. Now, just to give you some basic backstory for Barnett, 
Barnett is a very popular preacher who was a friend of Alexander Campbell's during the early years, and David Barnett is going to be active in the Ohio River Valley in places like Dayton, Ohio, and eventually Cincinnati, Ohio. In fact, Barnett will found what is known as the Christian Church at the corner of 8th and Walnut at downtown Cincinnati, and this will become one of the largest churches in the Restoration Movement by the time we get to the 1840s. And this guy is going to be a very charismatic preacher. He's going to be someone who's going to excite people about the gospel. And because of that, his church is going to be very successful and it's going to grow very big. Once he's got himself a very big church, he's going to run into the problem of he could be doing more ministry if he could get paid full time. And so David Barnett is going to be one of the first people who is going to draw a full-time salary doing ministry. Now, this is going to raise some instant questions from the point of view of the Restoration Movement, basically saying, we haven't ever paid our ministers full-time. And you know what else I don't see in the New Testament? We don't see anybody else getting paid full-time to do ministry by their church. And so, Barnett is going to kind of lead the way into this question of, well, what do we do when the church grows so big that we need to start thinking outside the box of what the New Testament teaches? Now, for Barnett and others, it's going to be just very simple. You do what is ever pragmatically necessary. If Barnett can make more converts, if we can make the church more healthy by paying him full time, which we can now afford to do because our church has grown so big, then let's do it. Others are going to say, no, if it doesn't say it in the New Testament, that is on that treads on very dangerous ground. It sets a precedent that says, well, why don't we just do whatever else seems to be working, regardless of what the New Testament says or doesn't say. And so this is going to be where the battleground is going to be drawn for pretty much the next hundred years in the Restoration Movement, is what does it mean to do something if it's expedient? If there's a good reason to do something, but there's no biblical mandate to do it or not to do it. And this will be the, known as the question of expediency, and we'll see this again and again and again through the rest of this class. Now. What we're going to note here is that David Barnett himself is going to be looking at what other denominations are doing, and he's going to get quite excited that because they're able to pool their resources, for example, the Baptists and the Methodists working in his area are going to have quite a lot of sway because they can pool their denominational resources and do some pretty spectacular things simply because they've got the money to get it done. And so he's going to suggest that the Restoration Movement could have a Bible society, that they could be printing their own Bibles without commentary, and that they could do that in a relatively cheap and easy way, but it's still going to require money from all of the churches participating. So David Barnett's call for a Christian Bible society is going to draw some fire from the Restoration Movement from two different angles. And the first of those angles is going to come from Alexander Campbell himself. Alexander Campbell is going to say that the Bible does not specifically authorize the formation of a parachurch organization. Uh, Campbell will say this in his Millennial Harbinger quote, I never was opposed to any Bible society in Cincinnati or New York or London, but I am and was opposed to any Bible society composed of a few individuals who, without any notification, shall constitute themselves as a continental association. Now, this might be a matter of splitting hairs and semantics, but here's the basis of, Cal of Alexander Campbell's argument. He's going to say, we can't create a parachurch organization because a we don't have a biblical mandate for it and secondly i'm opposed to this person saying we are the american bible society when i didn't necessarily vote for it someone down in tennessee didn't necessarily vote for it if they want to call themselves the cincinnati bible society or the david barnett's bible society we're, we're fine but don't call it a national or a continental society when it doesn't have the full support of everybody. Now, 
in some ways, I can understand his point, but in other ways, he is really just kind of stretching at the fact of don't of if you name something and I don't like the name or I think the name implies me when it doesn't. Well, does that mean it's necessarily wrong? I would argue it isn't, but many people will bounce on Campbell's uh, idea and run with it. They're going to say, you can't call this thing the American Bible Society because I didn't support it. You can call and so in many ways, this will be an issue of nomenclature. What do you name something? And many people have noted that Alexander Campbell seems to also be somewhat frustrated that this was his idea to organize the churches. But now that someone younger is getting on that bandwagon and actually accomplishing it, there may be a little bit of jealousy going on here, especially since Campbell being located in Bethany is still a very rural area. While Cincinnati is a growing place, it is becoming a very affluent place. And this may be just an example of a popular preacher who is gaining quite a national following is able to organize a national level thing. And Campbell's not necessarily on the ground floor for the first time. This may simply be a matter of what we would call sour grapes. We can't reach the grapes, so therefore we will rail against it. Now, the second complaint with this idea is going to come from people like Aylett Rains. And Aylett Rains is going to simply point out in Campbell's Millennial Harbinger that Bible societies already exist. He says, let's take a look at the Baptist. The Baptist already working in your area have already bought printing presses. They've already bought plates. They're already printing Bibles that don't have commentaries in them. And Reigns' basic idea is if we are a movement that is dedicated towards Christian unity and Christian cooperation, even across denominational lines, instead of creating a competing Bible society, why don't we just take the money we've already got and throw it to these people already doing what we're trying to do? That way we show a sense of Christian solidarity and we don't create a sense of Christian competition that we are somehow different or better. Now, personally, I like the rhetoric of this objection a lot more. It makes a lot more sense to me to say, if a Christian group is already doing something and you have no moral objections to it, why on earth wouldn't you support it in the name of Christian fellowship? Now, what's going to happen, eventually, many people within the Restoration Movement will try to support the Baptist Bible Society, and eventually this idea is going to come crashing down as the Baptists start to realize that they want denominational control over this project, and they don't want people from competing denominations interfering. And so, in many ways, the need for the Bible Society will simply be, even if we are willing to cooperate, it doesn't mean that other groups are wanting us to cooperate with them. And so, this is going to be the question of sectarianism in its probably purest form. What do we do if we want to contribute to another group, but they won't let us? Do we create a competing society and see if we can outdo them at their own game? Or do we just simply allow them to do their thing and we do other ventures that neither harm nor compromise their position? It's an interesting question, but the bottom line is going to be that David Barnett is not going to find either of these arguments terribly compelling, and he will spend most of the night of the 1840s arguing for the need for both his Bible society and for his new idea that he wants to start a missionary society. Now, if I had to sum up Barnett in a word, I would say this. David Barnett is a feisty, feisty man. And he's not going to take Alexander Campbell's criticisms lying down. And he's going to particularly note that Alexander Campbell has attempted to create a parachurch organization already. He's going to note that Campbell was saying, we need to find a way to educate our ministers. Campbell has started a new educational facility known as Bethany College. And 
Barnett is going to simply use Campbell's rhetoric against him. He's going to say, hey, Campbell, where in the Bible does it say you can start Bethany College? Or better yet, where was it that we as a group throughout the nation gathered together and said, let's start a college to train our ministers? Now, Campbell's going to fire back. I didn't call it the American Christian College. I called it Bethany College. He's going to basically say, it's a matter of names. It's a matter of what kind of affiliations do you have? But you can see here where the rhetoric is going to start getting a little bit nasty. They're going to basically say, a, well, who gives the right to create a parachurch organization? And once created, who controls it? Does the movement as a whole control it? Does the individual who put in the money control it? Is it controlled by the people who use the group? For example, Bethany College, is it controlled by the students and the faculty? Or with the Bible Society, is it controlled by the people who have to run the printing presses? And all of these questions of control and power go along with the problem of organization. The moment you get a group that has the access to money and the access to power, the question is, who gets to wield it and on what authority do they wield it? And this will become the driving problem with the societies in general, is that they will begin to create power. And where there's power, there will be people clamoring to get it, and there will be people who don't have it who don't like the fact that they don't have it. So let's try to wrap this all up in a nice little argument here before we go on to some of the problems created by this. And the biggest thing for David Barnett and his ministry is that he's going to create two national level societies for the restoration movement. He is going to create what he calls the American Christian Bible Society, and he is going to create a group called the American Christian Missionary Society. And again, the purposes of these groups are initially pretty obvious. The Bible Society is made to print Bibles and distribute Bibles. And the Missionary Society is there to fund missionary activities both at home in the U.S. and abroad across the world. And as these things get founded, we're going to notice three distinct problems. And the first is just downright the problem of money. When you create a national society a lot of money gets flooded into it. And the question is, who controls that? You know, if I am a person who has given $100 to this society, I get a title. I am a director for life. That is my title if I've contributed $100. Raises a question. What does it mean by I'm a director? Does that mean that anytime there's a vote, I get a vote? Does my vote count more than someone who's only given $50? Does my vote count five times as much as someone who only gave $20? Does my vote only count for one-tenth of someone who has given $1,000? And so this question of who has control will often come down to the question of money. And when it comes to the missionary society, this money issue is going to have a second problem. What happens when you send out a missionary if someone who is given a lot of money doesn't like that missionary or thinks that that missionary is going to do more harm than good? Should that person who's given a lot of money have veto power? And this brings up the question of authority. Who actually leads these societies? And the decision they'll come down to for the American Christian Missionary Society is that they will have a vote and they, they will vote in their leaders or their board of directors. But this also creates a second problem. Who does this group speak for? Does it speak for someone down in Tennessee who isn't supporting them with their money? If someone from Tennessee wants to come, but they haven't, de haven't spent any money, do they have any voice at all in the elections? And so this question of authority is going to drive this problem. And related to that is the final problem of what we would call jurisdiction. Does such a body 
like the American, Mission, American Christian Missionary Society, is their only job to send out missionaries? Or can they do other things with that money? Like, for example, try to print Bibles, or try to start a missionary training school, or whatever they decide to do with that money. And so the big question of what exactly is this group and who does it speak for will become paramount. Now, once the missionary society gets going, there's going to be many churches that will conscientiously object to this idea. Now, we could probably look at dozens of written documents that said, we think this is a bad idea, but we're just going to focus on one. This is probably the most popular be simply because it was so well written. But this comes from the Connellsville, Pennsylvania Church of Christ. And they're going to pass several resolutions that basically say, here's our problems with this society. And the first issue they're going to have is they say, you know what? We're not a very rich church. We can't afford to give any money to this group. And so they're going to say conscientiously, we cannot aid or sanction this society that would basically say, we can't have you giving your vote or your money or, or your input simply because you don't have the money to give. Here's, if I could summarize that argument, they're basically saying, look, you guys are excluding us because we're poor. And because you're excluding us, we can't say you're a good thing. Because, you know, if it's a good Christian society, it shouldn't be excluding anyone, even if we're poor. And building on that, they're going to say uh, that, the, that this is going to establish a very dangerous precedent. If we start a society that has no biblical basis, well, doesn't that just make us like other denominations? That they are starting all kinds of non-biblical things and then... What, where does that lead us? What kind of problems will that potentially cause? And so the question of do we have even the biblical authority to do something is going to become the rallying point for any kind of opposition to things like the missionary society. And again, the base of all of this is authority and money. And so here's the basic argument, if I could sum up the Connellsville argument in a nutshell, and it basically says this. One, there's no thus saith the Lord for the establishment of this kind of a parachurch organization. And because there is no thus saith the Lord, you have to basically argue very strongly that it is expedient to do something. And you know, what is expedient to one person may not be expedient to another. And so this whole issue is, it is very subjective what constitutes expediency. Now, the second of their issues is that these kind of organizations will take resources from authorized churches. And again, the problem here is the Connellsville Church is a fairly poor church. And they're going to basically say, if you are demanding dues for anyone who wants to join, or you're demanding that every church give a certain part of their budget, well, we are an authorized church. We are a church that exists on biblical principles, and you're not taking our money in order to support something that we don't even have a thus saith the Lord to support it. And so they're going to conclude this whole thing by basically wrapping up with a Romans 14 argument. They say, you're violating our conscience. And as Paul says, you know, if I'm eating meat and I'm causing someone to stumble, I'll never eat meat for the rest of my life because it is violating that person's conscience. The, this group basically says the same thing. If you violate our conscience, it is your job to stop. And so the arguments against the society are going to be based on these three ideas. We have no scriptural precedent that it's taking money away from churches working at the individual congregational level, and that if they have a conscience problem, the problem is in the innovation, and the innovator is the one who needs to stop, not the person who has the conscience issue. Now, here's the point where we have to probably say that in addition to the Connellsville Church, there are numerous other reactions from the leadership. And many people are going to start looking to these leaders, the people who are publishing in their magazines, basically saying, do you like this idea? Do you dislike this idea? And this is going to be one of the first major restoration movement 
issues where we're going to start to see that the publishers of the various magazines really can't agree on whether or not to like this idea or not to like this idea. So, for example, when this thing first gets started, people like Benjamin Franklin, Walter Scott, David Burnett, and Isaac Arrett will all come out in very firm support of the movement. Now, some people like Benjamin Franklin will eventually change their mind on it, but the rest will be fairly consistent in their support of this movement towards a national missionary society. Now, others like Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone are going to try to remain as neutral as possible. Now, we noted that Campbell did come out saying some objections to it, but he is going to eventually contribute money to both the American Bible Society and the American Christian Missionary Society. He is going to serve on the board of directors for both groups, but notice he'll also do this in abstentia. He will be elected as a board member. He'll never show up to act as a board member. And so in many ways, he will support it financially, but he will not support it with his presence. And in many ways, that can be just as much a denunciation or a detraction, because if you have a highly visible leader who is choosing not to be highly visible for this particular thing, it does send kind of a murmuring among the crowd of, well, what's wrong with this that Alexander Campbell won't show up? And then finally, we're going to notice that many people, and most of these will be hardcore Southerners, people like Tolbert Fanning, people like David Lipscomb, are going to basically say, this is a bad, bad, bad idea, and we can't support it. And they're going to use many of the arguments that we saw from the Connellsville Church. We don't see a thus saith the Lord to advocate why we should do this in the first place. It takes away resources from poor country churches, and we just don't like it. It's a conscience issue. And because it's a conscience issue, it's the job of the American Christian Missionary Society to cease and desist for the sake of our conscience. So now that we get all of that under our belts, let's actually go to show how this thing became even more controversial. And the first of these controversies is going to involve a man by the name of John T. Barclay. Barclay is going to be the first missionary that will be sent out by the American Christian Missionary Society, and he will be sent to Palestine. Now, he's going to be sent to Palestine in the 1850s, just a little bit before the Civil War gets started. And Barclay is going to become kind of a problem because he is a Southerner, he's a medical doctor, but he's a slaveholder. And so many of the abolitionists in the North are going to look at the American Christian Missionary Society and they're going to say, hey, whoa, 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 time out, time out here. You've sent a missionary who is a slaveholder. Are you telling us that you are going to send out someone to preach freedom of the gospel of Christ who would hold human beings in bondage of slavery at the same time? And so they're basically saying, we don't like this person's morals. And we don't trust this person to preach the gospel if we don't trust his morals. And again, we get back to the issue of money. If someone has given money to a missionary society, there's kind of a trust that is built in with this whole transaction. We will give you money if you will send out a missionary that we trust to do missionary work. Well, what happens if that trust is broken? If the people who have given their money say, well, we think this person you've sent out is morally corrupt, is not fit to be a missionary. Well, this is the problem of people sending money and then not having full authority to say where that money goes or how it's directed. And so this is going to keep building and building until the Civil War. And at which time the Missionary Society will get involved in another problem. This will be what is known as the Loyalty Resolutions. Starting in 1861, just right after the start of the Civil War, we're going to have a meeting of the American Christian Missionary Society. And that meeting is going to take place in Cincinnati, Ohio, a decidedly northern area north of the Ohio River. And so when this happens, 
for lack of a better term, shenanigans will ensue and a problem will be developed that will basically be the start of the split between what we would call the disciples of Christ and the non-instrumental churches of Christ. And so if you ask my opinion, this is where that split begins over the problem of the missionary society and the societal problems that generated it. All right, so let's look at that infamous 1861 meeting of the American Christian Missionary Society. And let's start with the problem of sectionalism. Sectionalism is just simply the idea that during the Civil War, the North and the South became political sections. And there was a dividing line of thou shalt not cross, and that line was a political border. To cross from the Union into the Confederacy, or to go vice versa, was to cross now an international border. And frequently, that border is going to be patrolled by military. And so, what we're going to find is that many people in the South simply cannot journey to the North to make a meeting of the American Christian Missionary Society. And so, when this meeting is called in Cincinnati, Ohio, the first and biggest question is going to be, how do we have any representation from the Southern people who've given their money if all we've got is Northerners there? And this is going to be one of the just kind of fascinating problems that without representation, many of the Southerners are going to say, this society no longer speaks for me, even though it has my money, because you are not allowing me to be represented, you are not letting my voice be heard, and quite frankly, when you gave a loyalty resolution, you didn't ask me whether I thought it was a good idea or not. And so this issue of sectionalism is going to drive this, and related to that, as we noted in our previous lecture, many people within the South are going to be pacifists. During the war, they are not going to see themselves as being part of the problem. They're not taking up arms in this war. But there are still Southerners, and many of them are going to say that the South had every right to leave the Union, i.e. they joined the Union by a majority vote. They should be able to leave the Union by a majority vote. And so what we're going to find is that when this meeting is of the American Christian Missionary Society takes place in the North, we're going to start to see, A, many of the Northerners who are not as inclined to be pacifist are going to show up, people like James A. Garfield, and when they do show up, they're going to be wearing their Union uniforms. They're basically going to be declaring through their state of dress, or their vestment, if you will, I am allied with the North. And so many of the people that arrived here are going to specifically have an agenda that the American Christian Missionary Society will do what many other groups have done in the North, which is that they will pledge their loyalty to the Union. That they will create a statement that says, we support this Union in, in the midst of the Civil War. And once they've made that decision, that this non-political group will make a political statement, fireworks are going to ensue. So let's take a look at why those fireworks happen. Because Thomas Campbell, at the very beginning of his involvement in this restoration movement, one of the things that he's going to note is, you know, the Presbyterian Church is divided over this thing called the Burger Oath. And the Burger Oath isn't a isn't a doctrinal thing, it's a political thing. People are questioning whether or not it's wise to make an oath of allegiance to a specific magistrate. We have the exact same problem here. We have an oath of allegiance being formulated by this group, the American Christian Missionary Society. And just like the Burger Oath, there's going to be a repercussion, there's going to be a split of people who say, no, we can't make that oath. It is compromising with our integrity to preach the gospel, to ally with a political entity. Whereas the people who are on the pro side of the oath are going to say, we need to do this. The government needs to be, no, it can, 
it can trust us. It needs to know we, we support it. It needs to know we are not an enemy. You need to be shooting at. And so this problem of church state interference is going to become paramount and it's going to raise the basic question of purpose of the Bibles of the missionary society. If the missionary society was made to send out missionaries, why on earth is it making a political statement? And if you're a Southerner, you're going to say, why on earth are you making a political statement with our money, which condemns our country? <laughs> and so we're going to have just this huge issue that when we've created a large scale society that is bigger than any one individual church, the question of control and power and just how much power is going to become the divisive issue of the time. Now, in addition to this, many people in the South that are with the Restoration Movement are going to honestly and genuinely believe that the South is in the right leaving the Union. And in doing so, they're going to ask the question, how can you morally denounce us through this institution that you are basically saying we are morally wrong? And of course, this raises all kinds of questions of excommunication. If someone is morally wrong, how can we have fellowship together? And so this is going to be a very bitter movement. And many people within the South are going to basically say this society should not exist any longer. So here are my concluding remarks on these developments. The first is this that the Restoration Movement will not divide during the Civil War, but it will contract a what I'll call a fatal disease. It will have a terminal illness from this point onward. And that illness is going to be kind of symbolized in the development of these two paradigms, that we're going to start to see a conservative group and a more liberal group start to branch out because of these developments. The groups that's going to favor what we'll call liberalism is going to basically say the gospel needs to be contextualized. The New Testament doesn't answer all of our questions. And therefore, whenever we reach a situation like the development of a missionary society, we need to have the freedom to make it. And this group is going to continue to explore this paradigm of making new societies, new bureaucracies, new ideas to basically supplement where the Bible is silent. And eventually what this will create, we would call the disciples of Christ denomination that they're going to eventually say by 19, by the 1960s, we simply need a full blown denominational structure. This idea of individual church polity isn't working any longer. We are now a denomination. Now, groups that dislike this movement are going to favor a very strict con congregational autonomy. And more specifically, that they're going to start disliking where Alexander Campbell is leading the movement during the 40s, the 50s, the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. They're going to basically say, no, the glory days of the movement was back in the 1820s and 30s when Alexander Campbell was writing his Christian Baptist, when he is denouncing all innovations that don't have a biblical, thus saith the Lord. And he's going to say, all contextualization of the gospel is wrong. And so this group is going to say, if we want a church to function well, we have to have a thus saith the Lord for everything we do. And so what we're going to see is that this conservative and this liberal split is going to begin to widen as the years go by. And as they start to create more innovations on the liberal side versus, and we start to find more and more points on the conservative side that we say, you know what, that's something that's an innovation that needs to stop. That's an innovation that needs to stop. And so we'll be looking at this all next week when we look at the developments in education and the developments in the use of musical instruments and worship. Both of these groups are going to have very strong points of view on this. And they're going to react according to this pre-established paradigm, which goes back just a little bit before the Civil War. And finally, I would 
like to bring us back one last time that this brings up once again this ever lingering question of the class. How is it that the church should deal with a problem when there is not an explicit solution in the Bible? And I find it ominous that around this time, Alexander Campbell will make probably his most controversial statement in his Millennial Harbinger. He's going to say this, quote, A book is not sufficient to govern the church. And of course, he's meaning the book being the Bible. Because Alexander Campbell is finally wrestling with and coming to grips with the fact that this book doesn't say everything that we have questions for. And even worse, this book has to be interpreted as he's coming into contact with all kinds of heretics that he's having to put in, in their place. He's realizing, more often than not, that the problem isn't that he's reading the Bible and they're not. The problem is he's reading the Bible and they are too, and one of them has to be right and the other one has to be wrong. And so Campbell is dealing with the fact that the problem is not that you're that is not in the reading of the Bible. The problem is that some people are interpreting the Bible incorrectly. And so he's coming to the conclusion here later in his life that the book by itself is insufficient, that there needs to be some kind of regulating hermeneutical paradigm to make this thing actually become a unifying factor. And so, just as we saw before, this will develop two trends, and those trends will be closely allied with the liberal and conservative trends that we discussed on the last slide. The conservatives are going to say, no, Campbell, you're wrong. No creed but the Bible, no creed but Christ actually works, and they're going to retreat as deeply into that as they can. And they're going to say, the early restoration movement is right. We have to tear down anything that isn't a biblical development. Likewise, the liberals are going to say, you know what? I think you're right, Campbell. We've been trying to regulate this group through the Bible, and we're just not seeing it working. Therefore, we need to start looking for other forms of authority. And this is going to lead many people within the group to basically say, if we don't look to the Bible, what do we look for? And your textbook by North is going to basically suggest that the hardcore conservatives are going to basically say, if we have to choose between unity of Christians and the truth of the Bible, we will choose the truth of the Bible. The liberal side, on the other, on the other hand, is going to say, if we have to choose between unity of Christians and the truth of the Bible, we will choose unity, even if it compromises the truth. And so, these two poles of unity of Christians and the truth of the Bible are going to start seeming to tug in opposite directions from this point onward. And it's going to make the calls of the Restoration Movement very difficult to maintain over the next century. So, folks, that about wraps it up for me. Uh, take care. God bless. We'll talk again next week when we discuss the issues of the musical instrument. We'll discuss the issues of continuing church education, particularly with the development of the modern university. And then finally, we'll conclude with J.W. McGarvey, who will basically set the final paradigms in motion that will lead to both the division of the non-instrumental church, as well as the division between the conservatives and the liberals of the disciples movement. So take care, my friends, and we'll see you later.